Sage's Stories. Welcome to today's episode of Sage's Stories, the official podcast of Sage's, the Society of American Gastrointestinal and Endoscopic Surgeons. Please make sure to hit the like button and subscribe so you can stay up to date with our most recent episode and enjoy the show. Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to episode 15 of Sage's Stories, where we shine the light on some of Sage's most impactful leaders. I am your co-host, Dr. Sharin Tofai, coming to you from lovely Los Angeles, California. And oh, hey, look who joined me out here today. That's right. Each year, it's my goal to do at least one of these shows with you in person. And what better time than for our second episode of 2023 when the snow is kind of starting to pile up in Cleveland? Oh, my God. At this rate, you would just need to stay longer, right? Well, as it turns out, I'm hopping on a red eye to Cleveland in a few hours. So to say, as they say, no rest for the weary. I I do have some friends in L.A. who will now know that I was in in the city for less than 20 uh, four hours. So, oh, my Lord. don't you have your own private jet? What do you mean? Uh, not, quite, not quite. <laughs> it, it's in the shop. Uh, I got to slug it on uh, commercial airline uh, this time. Well, today's Sage's Stories guest is a superstar. We have had the pleasure um, of inviting her. I have had the pleasure of knowing her. Um, we're finally doing a West Coaster uh, as one of our Sage's guests, like me. So, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Mary Hahn. She is currently the Emil Professor and Chair of the Department of Surgery at Stanford University. You may have heard of that institution, Kevin, even though it's not in Cleveland. Uh, yeah, I've heard of it. I've <laughs> heard of it. <laughs> Dr. Hahn has been a prominent academic surgeon her entire career and is, after spending decades on Eastern Standard Time, she finally saw a light and joined us out in California in 2015. I have personally seen how much Dr. Hahn has advanced her department since her arrival as its leader, and I am so excited to have her share her story with you. So welcome, Mary, to Sage's Stories. Great. Thanks so much for having me. So I'm not sure that with all your responsibilities, you've you've had a chance to listen to any of our previous podcasts, but uh, unlike some uh, surgical podcasts out there, Sage's Stories is all about the guest. Uh, We want to really get to know the person behind the star surgeon that you are. Uh, So we always start with an open-ended question where we hear a little bit about your early years. Where did you grow up? And then what were some of the important moments on your journey? It's only been, what, 21 years, right? Only 21 years. (laughs) I knew the dogs would decide to bark as soon as we started. We recording. we love yeah we love having <laughs> addition yeah dogs are good yeah, yeah. Do- dogs barking yes and all of that um so I am a native of Michigan I grew up in Michigan's Upper Peninsula which not many people have traveled across the bridge or or, or been to a small town and um uh, my father was a dentist it was the town dentist and my um uh I have six brothers and sisters and wow. so spent my my, Where did you fit uh, in there? I'm number six of seven. You're number six. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, see if I can. and tell me a little bit about um, how that affected kind of your interest in going to the sciences. Yeah, I think for some reason, I was always interested in medicine, you know, kind of as you read other people's, you know, CVs or their personal statements, they either wanted to be a doctor, I'm sorry, there's a lot of dog rustling going on in the background. We don't, here. we don't hear it, so it's okay. Oh, good. Oh, yeah, good. Okay, good, yeah. good, good. Okay. Um, so anyway, so I think, you know, I wanted to be a doctor from quite a young age. Um, I was just always interested in medicine, I think interested in helping people. And that interest stayed throughout um, middle school, high school. And um, I applied to Michigan's Interflex program, which is no longer in existence, but it was a um, integrated pre-medical medical program where you essentially got accepted to medical school out of high school. And so once, you know, that from there, from graduating high school and starting a program that had a direct path into med school was pretty straightforward. That's pretty cool. I mean, you clearly had an affinity to Ann Arbor. It's a pretty awesome place for an academician. So given how many years you spent there during training, it would be great if you could tell us a little bit about 
what kept you there for undergraduate and postgraduate education? Was it family as well or any other ties? Yeah, so, you know, so I did undergrad and med school there. And then um, when I was looking around for my surgery residency, and part of me wanted to leave and to go experience and, and go somewhere else. But then I think after I looked around, it just was such an awesome training program. It was 1991. There weren't that many women going into surgery, yet, yet there were a lot of women in surgery at Michigan. So some of my role models, some of the people who inspired me to go into surgery were some of the uh, junior women residents that I got a chance to work with as a medical student. And, and who were um, they? Do you remember some names that were Of course, yeah. Here? So Diane Simeone, who's an HPB uh, pancreas surgeon. She's at NYU now. Yeah. Go HPB. Yeah. Go HPB. Yeah. We yeah. hear HPB at least once every conference. Yeah. Uh, Wendy Wall, uh, who's a trauma critical care surgeon, was at Michigan forever. And now I think she's at the Ohio State. Whoa. And uh, there we go. Yeah. Ohio. Okay. Did you have to do this, Mary? Ohio. <laughs> We're trying to reduce the number of Ohio mentions, yeah. but it never happens. Okay, yeah. sorry. Sorry yeah. to interrupt. Yep. Yeah. And then uh, Sonia Sugg, who's an endocrine surgeon, surgical oncologist, breath, I think does breast surgery as well at University of Iowa. So they were uh, three just awesome women who were PGY2s, I think, when I was a third year medical student and just um, really fun to work with. And I was so impressed by them. And then you, so what ended up keeping you there uh, for, for all your training? So you, you did pretty much everything and stayed on. Undergrad, med yeah. school, residency, yeah. uh, my lab years. And then I was on faculty for two years. There. Yeah. But that was then, now that was my husband. So he was finishing his residency in okay. ENT and he had a couple of years uh, left to go. So I stayed on and was on faculty for two years while he finished his residency. And then we ventured to the West Coast for the first time to Oregon for our MIS fellowships. And he did a, a head and neck reconstructive fellowship at OHSU. Okay. So you kind of went out together for that fellowship yeah. year. Yeah. So my wife is uh, also a U of M alum and we were pretty bummed about the end of the football season. Um, has your allegiance changed to the Cardinal team or do you still go to sleep saying go blue? <laughs> Oh, uh, I still definitely go to sleep saying go blue, but I mean, I, I have an affinity for the Cardinals too. It's, it's rare that there would ever be a conflict to, to uh, root for both teams, but um, I have to say I was okay. I mean, after they beat Ohio state, that was just, I mean, at that's Ohio a, that's state. Enough. It's okay. That, to that be, was, once you meet Ohio state, everything's I mean, gravy. That, exactly. Exactly. And I think they would have just gotten beaten up by Georgia again. That's what happened last year. So, you know, at least we thought, you know, they kept giving us hope that they were going to beat TCU. Yeah, you know, I would say both Michigan and Stanford have very, very loyal alumni, like for sports, for anything that that the their alumni connection is so unique, and and you you're attached to both, so that's kind of a unique um, unique situation with you. So yeah. you did mention about your Oregon um, uh, OHSU kind of fellowship. I guess you got your first taste of the West Side living. Um, when you went there for fellowship, that was 2000, 2001. And I remember in 2000, Kev, Kevin, you were still probably in pre-K, but uh, in 2000, um, that was not the case. There weren't 150 plus MIS based fellowships like there are today. Um, residency didn't necessarily incorporate MIS in their, in their uh, general surgery uh, curriculum. So what made you want to do a fellowship? Um, there was no fellowship council back then. And what made you choose Oregon at the time? Yeah, so a uh, great question. And I think it's total serendipity. My husband was applying for fellowships first. And um, the two places he was really interested in were, uh, or his match was going to be first. And as you know, MIS is in a match. So the two places he was really interested in were University of Minnesota and, um, and Oregon. And so if he had matched it in Minnesota, I probably would have applied to their colorectal fellowship because mm -hmm. it was also a one-year fellowship. It would have matched up. We could have, you know, because rather than going and trying to practice for a year or living apart, we had um, our daughter at that time. So she was just um, not quite two years old. So we, um, you know, didn't want to live apart. And so I said, well, I'll apply. Oregon has MIS fellowships, but not colorectal fellowships. And I had always liked it, you know, mentally invasive surgery and and having been an attending for two years, realized how much I didn't know. Um, 
or I, that I couldn't teach other people to do. So it was really, I think, an incredibly uh, useful skill set to get. And, and that's that's right. I, I noticed that a lot of your research years were were dedicated toward colorectal diseases. So it was uh, was that your initial kind of hope was to to go into a colorectal fellowship. You know, I think people didn't. I mean, when I finished, a, a lot of my fellow resident residency mates didn't do GI fellowships. Mm, uh, yeah. You know, most and even at Michigan, if you even look now, like Justin Dimmick and Amir Ghaffari, they never did an MIS fellowship. Yeah, they were just um, grandfathered into the world. Yeah, same but, with and, me. I didn't do a fellowship. But, Right, but and much yeah. younger than me. I'm right. So even when there were fellowships out, and most people were doing fellowships to do bariatrics, they didn't. So um, it kind of wasn't the culture. And at that time, colorectal really wasn't uh, an academic. Uh, if you want to do a colorectal practice, you were or fellowship, you're most likely going to go into private practice. And I think I noticed this switch somewhere between 2006, maybe 2000, maybe more 2008 where all of a sudden colorectal to me became a very competitive academic fellowship. And I think it was a lot of people who wanted to do oncology. They were looking at surgeon fellowships, the difficulty of getting mm -hmm. HPV jobs afterwards. You could go do a surgeon fellowship and then end up doing mm -hmm. a lot of things you didn't want to do. Or you could do a one-year colorectal fellowship, do GI surgery, GI oncology. And, um, and so it seemed like almost overnight colorectal went from being a very community, mostly private practice type uh, fellowship experience to a very uh, academic competitive fellowship. Yeah. Yeah. And, th and then even just kind of looking at your your trajectory, uh, like many of our guests, we, we've always found it interesting to learn about job transitions over the years. Um, it's definitely a common theme for our young trainees listening uh, know, to know that a common it's common to change at least three times, if not more. And you've certainly fit that. And uh, you started in a position where you trained also not too unlike many recent graduates, myself included. However, after a few years, you, you made a pretty significant move south to Alabama. So what was that first uh, job transition like? Yeah, so that was actually coming on a fellowship. Right. Out of so fellowship. To, yeah. So oh, we've okay. Gone to Oregon to so do I, I must have missed the the years there. Okay. So right, you. Right. Okay. Yeah, so I thought you went. Right. I thought you yeah. went back. Okay. So you you mm -hmm. did two years at Michigan, then went. To, okay. I got it. Yeah. And then went. We went and did fellowships, and then um, we were looking for jobs, and we said we'd go new, anywhere but New York, L.A. Sorry, Sharon, or the Deep <laughs> South. <laughs> so. And um, in New York, LA, mostly I had a, my son during fellowship. So we had a six month old and a two and a half year old. And we didn't think we wanted to live in a big metropolis where you spent a lot of time driving and commuting. Um, yeah. And uh, and then the deep south, because we just didn't know anything about it. So we didn't think we would quite fit in there and ended up in Birmingham, Alabama for our jobs. You know, what's fascinating is Alabama is an amazing academic institution. Yes. I know for hernias, and for robotic surgery, they're really, really good. They may be the most advanced faculty for robotic surgery, actually, in terms of volume and and what they do. So, you know, it's Alabama, so you don't really consider it like a, a, maybe a top academic institution. And yet for surgery, it really is. Did you feel the same? When so you were there? The, the interesting thing about UAB is it's young. I think when I was there, they had just maybe celebrated their 50th anniversary of the school of medicine mm -hmm. it's a very young academic medical center um it was a great place to be a surgeon i mean i think it probably still is a great place to be a surgeon um it was basically um john kirkland came down from the mayo clinic and really i think trans oh. you know really really built up the surgical programs there as a cardiac surgeon but brought that kind of mayo principal clinical care um uh you know, philosophy uh, to to UAB, but it was also an incredibly academic place. I mean, if you remember Harrison's principles of internal medicine, Tinsley and Harrison were yeah. um, at UAB. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, yeah, pretty amazing. Um, you know, uh, I just I'm just fascinated by UAB. I just think it's, <laughs> I want to visit. It. I've never been. Have you been there? Uh, I've never been. My roommate from college went there for his postgraduate. Uh, degree. He loved it. Yeah. Yeah. Abhishek Parmar, if you're watching this, invite me over. 
um, <laughs> okay, so let's shift gears a little bit. Let's talk about another uh, clear passion of yours, which is research. To start, um, one of the impressive aspects of your CV is the number of grants you've been able to secure. It's really impressive. Many of you, our listeners may know just how competitive it is to secure outside funding. And it's getting worse and worse every year in terms of difficulty. So maybe you can share us a little bit your secret sauce. Um, is it your amazingly innovative research questions? Is it just you and your success rate and your pedigree? Do you know how to write the best grant or de devise the best research project? Like what's the secret sauce? I think for me, it was mentorship. I had an amazing mentor at, um, at uh, UAB, this woman, Katerina Kifa, who also, I think, uh, Hina Santry, she mentored her because Katerina ultimately went to UMass and was a mentor for Hina as well. Um, but a primary care preventive medicine uh, uh, division chief who had a big health services research center. And, um, and I think she realized there was a paucity of health services research and surgery and she took me under her wing and my first project actually had to do with hernias because when I was a resident um, what did you say did you say that word again say that word. <laughs> hernia? A I hernia know surgeon. yeah yeah That's because you know, when I was a resident all my attendings did it differently <laughs> you know whether you put mesh in or would put mesh in yeah. um and then when I went and did my fellowship in Oregon they had a very different you know, philosophy about what to do uh, for um, how to fix hernias. And you just, I mean, you know, we were talking about variation is such a, a great natural experiment, right? If you see a lot of variation out there, it's because we don't know what yeah. the outcomes are. Yeah. And um, so we designed this trial and the best place to do it was in the VA at that time, because the VA had a national electronic medical record. Yep. And we could pull everything out. We could pull op notes out. Uh, which we did. Some of my research residents read through all the op notes um, and tried to figure out uh, what was actually done during the procedure. And, um, and then we could follow the outcomes on the patients and look for reoperations. We actually sent surveys to patients trying to get us to tell them whether or not they developed a recurrence or not. So it, and anyway, so that was um, kind of my first um, entry into getting funding and the VA has a special health services research and development funding program. So they specifically funded health services research versus when you go to the in institutes, it is harder to get data sciences funded. If you're not doing more translational research, clinical trials and things like that, it is harder to get, um, it's not impossible, but the amount of funding uh, is not necessarily always there. So find a grant writing mentor. That is the secret. Yes, or chat G GPT now. Yeah, chat GTP. Yeah, that's right. Chat GTP. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's going to be the, that's true. I mean, I, just, or just crank that out. You're right. That's actually. It's, it's crazy. I wonder if. Uh, you, well, it just I, opened. I am it sure. Just, uh, uh, it my just opened. Was, yeah, it did just open, it, but my it, son was showing it to me over uh, the winter break. And it, we said, hey, write a grant on, I can't remember what it was. Yeah. It literally oh, wrote man. out a specific AIMS page Have in 30 seconds. Have you played with this thing yet? Have you played with this? I played with it and I got my, my. it, it is, it is really terrifying and, yes. uh, you know, exciting at the same time. I, I showed my kids, I, my 14 year old, 12 year old. I mean, they, they sat there for about a half hour, maybe more asking, you know, to write a story about a Stranger Things spinoff character. I mean, I mean, it's one of my yeah. friends had, uh, wrote a lot of recommendation. With wow. It. I mean, <laughs> yeah. It, it Thank is, you notes. Yeah. Yeah. So grant writing, chat GTP or find a mentor. Uh, exactly. There, there you go. Yeah. They're not exactly. sponsoring this. <laughs> they're not. They're not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This open yeah. AI. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. that's funny. So you've 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 taken a look at it too. I there's. I've definitely been uh, interested in hearing how, and maybe you can talk about this, but, you know, uh, certainly at a uh, level of, of education and, and integrity, uh, it's, it's going to be an issue for, for some of the open-ended question type things. Yeah. I think the personal statements next year for residency applications. Uh, <laughs> augmented, right? Yeah. That's true. Wow. Very, wow. Good one. So another unique characteristic looking through your research is is really the breadth of fields that you've studied um, in the 160 plus 
publications listed, uh, topics range from cardiac outcomes, opioid prescribing, colorectal surgery, surgery education, even hernia surgery. And again, now I know why Sharon loves you so much. So, <laughs> but how did you get interested in such a vast array of surgical topics? Was it just you had a question on something and you said, let's look at this? Or because again, most most people sort of have uh, you know more narrow, I guess, breadth when you look look at what they're p- pumping out. Yeah, I think almost all of it was driven by you know a policy, a question whether it was the surgical care improvement project policy. You know, did that make a difference? Was it going to was it improving outcomes? I had been involved with that. Um, the cardiac stent one, you know, trying to get an anesthesiologist to put a symptomatic patient at like a asymptomatic cardiac, but symptomatic other disease patient to sleep with less than 365 days after a drug eluting stent was almost impossible. Mm. Yeah. And it seemed like the data were not very strong to support that. And, and I think once I kind of got familiar with just the, the richness and the robustness of the VA data that you could use to answer some of these questions with all the limitations that VA data has in terms of the, their demographics of their patient population and things like that, um, it just became um, just a really fun place to try and say, can we, can we answer these questions better? Can we, um, you know, develop, uh, uh, better insight into how we should really care for patients? Wow. That's really good. I want to hone in on some of your research regarding surgical education simulation. I was very involved with that earlier, early in my career. You are now in the heart of significant innovation, particularly in the computer and technology industries. I don't know if being in Northern California is um, is part of it, but what have been the lessons you learned about training in surgery and how technology has played a role in how we train surgeons in 2023? Yeah, I, I mean, I think for sure, it's just things, robotics, laparoscopic surgery, people yeah. shouldn't be tying their first knot like in a patient, right? They should be practicing suturing, warming up, um, training. I think video is going to be a huge um Uh, asset to to help us all improve our performance whether it's technical or non-technical we put the or black box in four of our rooms and have had data coming out of that for about six months so actually and i recruited theodore to stanford Um, really yeah that's fantastic yeah so he joined our faculty last fall and i've got carla pew who's putting sensors on everything yeah yeah studying our motion so we've got i think a powerhouse of people who um, are really interested in that, um, really studying surgeon performance, um, knowledge acquisition, and how we train the surgeon of the future. That that's fantastic. Um, you you've also studied a, a field that is de- near and dear to my heart and uh, some of our other guests, which is uh, common bile duct stone management. Um, I'm going to also use this opportunity to put in a shameless plug, which is no <laughs> surprise. Sharon knows on the. Sage's session, Master. yeah, on laparoscopic <laughs> co- common bile duct exploration that uh, Ezra Teitelbaum and I are co-leading at the Sage's National Meeting in Montreal in March. Um, so you don't want to miss that. But in any case, I, I think there's definitely been a tug of war uh, between surgery and GI uh, regarding the bile duct over the course of uh, many decades. So what's your take on it now? And, and uh, you know, what have you learned in some of the research you've looked at? Uh, well, I, I think we should treat the gallbladder when the, you know patients have common duct stones, even if they've been cleared. I have to say, I think nationally, we probably have lost the battle over the bile duct stone. And I'm really more worried about the other interventional endoscopy procedures. So I used to do all the Heller myotomies in the state of Alabama. And um, yeah. now that I'm at wow. Stanford, I do an occasional few every year of patients who either have big hiatal hernias, other structural anomalies, um, uh, you know, had some prior surgery that might make a home uh, difficult or challenging or dangerous. But uh, most of that procedure uh, where I am has gone to interventional endoscopies. But we're, we trained one of our uh, MIS surgeons, did six months of interventional endoscopy and mm-hmm. is doing some poems and cheap poems. Yeah. So, you know, the endoscopic treatments for reflux, endoscopic sleeves. Um, I, I think, um, I think the general surgeon needs to, uh, embrace the endoscope. Yeah. I once heard from a mentor, this, the, he or she who holds the knife should hold the scope. Uh, yeah. I think that's really, uh, was wise. I, I, I think endoscopy plays 
even though I do a lot of HPV, it probably plays about a 30 to 40% uh, part of my practice. I do poems, pops, uh, as well as, mm -hmm, yeah, yeah. I did Heller's, but you know, like Mary, I thought I saw that, you know, if you're not doing the endoscopic treatments, it'll go the way the cardiac of surgery, you know, I mean, so I think we have to, we have to keep holding the scope for sure. Yeah. 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 And I would, I would love to pick up, you know, but for me trying to find time in my, you know, you know, practice or, you know, to train and to do it and to get patients, but Michaela's doing it. You can come on out to Cleveland uh, in February. February is a good time in Cleveland. Uh, You've been to Ann Arbor, (laughs) so, you know, Um, but no, yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's a great, great field. I, I've been able to proctor a few people as well, but it, it's really a, a tremendous addition to the toolbox of a surgeon yeah right. and so to that point like one of my junior partners who was our resident she stayed on for our fellowship and i that's what i said to her i said you need to get interventional endoscopy skills mm. so yeah um she has done that i'm like you're way too young in your career to um not put that into your toolbox and embrace it but see this is a sign of a great chairwoman which is understanding the needs and really promoting yeah. excellence in their faculty Okay, one last question on research. Of all the topics you've investigated, which one doesn't have to rhyme with Kernia was your favorite? <laughs> I think my favorite study that we did was um, you know, this is around the time they were doing the NISQIP calculator, and we did the same thing with the Michigan Surgical Quality Data, developed this risk calculator. And I did this with Lee yeah. Meyer when she was at Utah. And so we did this thing, and then we said, well, is this even useful? So we had 1500 patients that we prospectively saw in clinic um, and the surgeon would just fill out this form. I think their risk of infection is this. I think their risk of having an MI is this. And, um, and then a research coordinator would collect all the data and kind of spit out what the score was. And then we followed the outcome of the patient to say who was right. And um, getting back to the chat GPT or, you know, how can we use um, these data to really help us? And, the things that I loved about that study were um, were that the surgeons were actually pretty good. They were but pretty as close. The risk of, as the risk of the procedure went up, the uh, the difference between what the model said was going to happen and what the surgeon said was going to happen started to separate. It so on the higher risk, oh. yeah, the higher risk procedures, we um, we looked more favorably on what the outcome could be, and. Um, so that I thought that was pretty funny. We definitely oh, surgeons definitely over prescribed risk to obesity. Mm. Um, then mm. then's really is really there. I think mostly because um, it's more painful, more technically difficult, but actually the outcomes you know aren't that different for patients for the most part uh, in our study. So so that was pretty funny. And we had the residents, and we there's we didn't have on all fifteen hundred. It was just a small subset, so we didn't publish that part. But we had the residents also rate it. <laughs> the residents were like. Everybody's gonna die. Like, you know, <laughs> the residents just thought nobody was gonna. No do one's well. gonna live. Like Their BMI is yeah. over forty. Yeah. 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 So it was so pretty they... funny. It was pretty funny to to just see the difference. But but you know, a, a specialist surgeon pretty much has kind of a calculator in their head. Um, cool. And but I, we thought that the tool would really help either the less educated people who don't see that disease very often, or it could be a communication tool for the anesthesiologist and nursing team, things like that, that they really need that data too. Like who's at risk for a post-op MI, who's at risk for, um, you know, a surgical site infection, et cetera. So had this, did this translate into a product that that's, that's used or that's available? You know, uh, well, so kind of at the same time, the ACS made the NISCO calculator. The same, with the, that, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so kind of took, I think yeah. that was, you know, and we wanted to do a trial to actually, you know, kind of implement it, but it, that again, getting to, uh, nobody really wanted to fund that. Nobody really yeah, wanted sure. to fund, you know, doing an intervention and really kind of studying the implementation of that intervention, you know, making these data available to the whole team and the patient, um, you know, did it change outcome and things like that. It was just really hard to find an agency, even HRQ um, mm. wasn't interested in funding it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're the official podcast of Sages, but we do recognize there are many great surgical societies out there, and you certainly have been a leader in many of these. Um, so I think given the the number, how did you decide where to devote your energy and leadership with all the great options out there? Yeah. Um, 
I think part of it was just opportunity, um, you know, and it's local, right? If you have kind of local involvement in a society. So Selwyn Vickers got me involved in FSAT. And then as he went into leadership, um, um, you know, kind of got me more involved in the organization and on committees. Um, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay, good. Um, and then um, the board, the board, I think, actually has been an incredibly valuable and Sharon, that's one of the first times we met, we worked yes. on the hernia um, questions for the certifying exam. So for all the people out there yep. who are taking their general surgery certifying exam, and if you get hernia questions, you can blame us. <laughs> uh, some of them I still recognize as I give them. I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember that one. <laughs> you know, you know, the for the oral boards. Hernia yes. question is the most failed question. Wow. Did you know that, Kevin? Yeah. It's not HPV. It's that's hernia. True. It's so complex. <laughs> so I've interesting. Whole... Yeah. That blew I me away. I, you know, that's interesting. <laughs> I did not know that. I did not know that. We broke yeah. some tough questions, yeah. I guess. Yeah. I don't know. That's because they put they make it be a cerotic and you gotta manage it. Still. Yeah. 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 Well, that's real life. That is yeah. Real. Yeah. Anyway, so I think, you know, I, and I think a lot of exciting collaborations between the board and SAGES. Um, and, uh, and now with the, the SAGES president, you know, John Mellinger is leading the Entrustable Professional Activity Project for the board that's going to roll out um, this year. Yeah, he was one of our uh, earlier guests on SAGES stories. Really, really great. So you were named chair of surgery at Stanford University in 2015. I'm a little jealous because I would love to have had you as my chairwoman. I think I would work for you in a heartbeat. Um, <laughs> this is a position that you continue to hold today. What have you been, what has been the main lessons you've learned now that you've been in the job for so long at such an internationally prestigious institution? I think, um, yeah, I think as leaders of surgeons, the main thing we just need to remember is how hard people have worked to get to this stage in their career. And if they kind of fall down in some area or things like that, it's really on us to, you know, try and try and get them back on track and stuff. And even, you know, I was um, a division chief at UAB for nine years before I went to Stanford. And the same thing there is just, um, you know, recognizing that our, our colleagues are an incredibly um, valuable resource and who have invested a lot of time in their careers. And every, everybody will have a time in their career, I think, where they don't, um, you know, they're not their best. It could be something personal happening, could be uh, to get burnt out, other, you know, stressors. And then how do we kind of identify and intervene and, and um, get them back to a place where they're you know, really productive and, and satisfied with their job and, you know, a good professional colleague. So I think those are, those are like the toughest parts of my yeah. job is dealing just with, um, you know, and, you know, luckily they don't come around that often, but they, they really do occupy a lot of, a lot of energy and time and thoughtfulness. Yeah. yeah. Two other topics you, you wrote about and, and I'm sure tackle very routinely as a chair are diversity in the workforce and healthcare disparities. And I think in many respects, these two issues go hand in hand. So how are we doing on these two vital issues? Uh, that's part one. Did you feel that as a female chair, it was a positive force in improving recruitment of female surgeons, for example? And then finally, where do we focus our efforts as a field in the next five to 10 years? Yeah, I think I think it has been an advantage to recruit women, uh, for sure. And I think being a chair, you know, we talked a little bit, I think, before we turned the tape recorder on, but being part of a dual professional couple, being a parent, um, all those things, you know, you bring to your job with you that help you maybe better relate or understand um, the, the competing needs that we all have in our lives. Uh, diversity is is. Um, you know, something we can't take our eye off of. And, uh, you know, it's very easy to, you know, we were just looking at our rank list today and we kind of were looking through and trying to just be very intentional. Like, listen, yeah. our, our program is underrepresented in X. We need to, you know, really try and recruit um, uh, this type of diversity to our program uh, because we think it's going to make us better. It's going to be better 
for us, it's going to be better for our patients. It's going to help us to understand, I think, the health needs of our patients if we have people from different backgrounds um, in our program. Yeah. You mentioned the dual professional couple. So uh, as you've explained, your husband is also a surgeon. Um, if he did an academic uh, reconstructive had a next surgery fellowship, then he's very busy doing really long and very important operations. Um, we kind of know a little bit about your background and, and where your husband is and where you are. Do you want to just explain uh, new his new job and maybe explain how you handle <laughs> balancing everything? Yeah. Yeah. So my husband's a head neck surgeon. Uh, he does mostly free flaps. And he runs a NIHR one funded lab looking uh, at molecular imaging. Um, was pretty early in that field. They have a couple of agents that they can use to light up tumors. And I think for him, it was kind of driven by, you know, if you remember your ENT rotation, if you ever did it, you know, there's a tumor in the mouth and they send off like 30 frozen sections trying to figure out where the, where the margins of it are. And like, could, if we could just light up the tumor and kind of know um, and help guide resection. So, um, he's got a couple clinical trials out there. Anyway, long story short, we were both in Birmingham doing great. I was division chief of GI surgery. He was division chief of uh, otolaryngology. And um, and then the job came along at Stanford. And I was kind of trying to decide if I wanted to apply for chair jobs. And um, I applied at a few places. And then the Stanford one looked like it actually might work. And they were very aggressive about recruiting him as well. Um, mm -hmm. They didn't have a department chair job in otolaryngology. Uh, they had a medical director at the cancer center. And he did that for seven years. Uh, was, it had been a tough job. Several people at it had failed before. It's, it's sure. not as much of a positional leadership job as a chair job is. And yeah. he did a great job with it. And his research really took off. And um, But then... The pandemic was kind of waning down. The kids were out of the house and he really wanted to be a department chair. And um, so he thought he would start kind of applying for jobs and seeing what was out there and then got the offer for the Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt chair job, which is an amazing department. And yeah. um, so we had a lot of long talks about it. I have a lot of friends who who have um, marriages like this. Lee Neumeyer, who's been a longstanding friend uh, and mentor of yeah. mine. Uh, when Barbara Bass and her husband lived apart from, I think, almost the entire time she was chair at Methodist. So I, you know, leaned on some of my friends who had done it and said, how does it work? Um, uh, can you make it work? And um, so we have a condo in Nashville. We have a house here in Palo Alto with the dogs. And then uh, a crazy third thing I did is I bought a house in northern Michigan because I've always wanted a house on Lake Michigan. So <laughs> you can meet, in, meet in the middle. Can, sort yeah, of. Although it's, it's yeah. not easy to get yeah. there from, for either of us. Yeah, it's either. Like yeah, it's yeah. Probably, you yeah. probably should yeah. probably meet in Chicago for the exactly, Leo or, exactly, yeah. which we do Why sometimes. Ohio? Why yeah. Why you know, Chicago? Yes. They go, they're gonna go to Chicago. That's where the yeah, his, his brother are. lives in Chicago. So oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah, that one works too. Wow, yeah, and your children are where? So, my daughter's in San Francisco. Um, she is a political science uh person, but working, working in a health informatics lab. Uh, mm -hmm. trying to understand how physicians use the EMR and how the EMR can use physicians. Um, and um, and then my son is a senior at University of Oregon, wants to go to med school and uh, scribing in an emergency room. So it's fun to talk with him oh. about what he sees come through the door. That's great. That's great. Yeah. And then so, two dogs. Yep. And two dogs. Yeah. Well, what, what are the dogs? Yeah. What are the dogs names? We love the dogs. dogs are Pippa and Fergie. They're Vishlas, if anybody knows. Oh, Vishla, is. Yes. Yeah. I have a friend who has, it's beautiful. They're beautiful. They're beautiful, but they're beautiful. very energetic. They're Hungarian. Yeah. They're pointers, they're long, but they kind of long, oh, long like lean. Me. They're kind of like Weimaraners. Yeah, German yeah. short hair. Very it, tall too. So it matches. Yes. They like to run. <laughs> yeah. They're, yeah, yep. Matt Crow. I don't know if you know Matt Crow. He's got yeah. a Vishla. Yeah, he's got a Vishla. Yeah. He does. Shout yeah. out to Matt. Yeah. Shout out to Matt. I'm sure he yeah. Does. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so can you tell us a little bit about uh, your introduction to Sages? When did you first know about it and, and you know, your involvement in the society? Yeah, so, um, so there weren't, I, I didn't know much about it. And then... Um, 
you know, when I decided I was going to apply for an MIS fellowship, I said, well, I should go to SAGES conference. So, but I didn't know anybody there. I don't think anybody at Michigan was really involved with SAGES at that time. And so, um, you know, so I was kind of lurking and stalking people and you know, figuring out what they were talking about. And it was in the, the late nineties, I remember going and learning about the new MIS OR suites and how they were going to oh, yeah. be designed. Yeah. I remember the old towers yeah. that you'd roll in with the, yeah. Yeah. Um, I love yeah. that. Yeah. We, we're, yeah. we're similar in our, <laughs> yeah, exactly. our experience there. Yeah. 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 Those big boxes that yes. were top heavy. You were afraid yeah. that it would fall yeah. on. Yeah. 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 And you're kind of like your neck's down. like this because they can't yeah. move the monitor, yeah. like either to yeah. your head height or yeah. yep. Yeah. Yep, yeah. that one. The one, yeah. did you do the single single tower? Yep. Everyone had to look at one tower. Yeah. You had to contort mm -hmm. your body. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is it. Yeah. Yeah. Those are the days. And then um did my fellowship at OHSU. And actually John Hunter came halfway through okay. uh, my fellowship. I actually did John's first case with him at um OHSU, which was cool. fun. And it was fun to kind of learn from him. You know, I kind of learned from Brett Shepard, who was a super busy surgeon doing whipples and so he just basically put you in the room to do the MIS stuff um, and and had an incredibly busy four gut practice as well um, so it was a great fellowship and then John came and taught me a few more tricks which was great um, yeah. and so but was much more involved with sages yeah well now is our favorite segment of the show it's called the we are the sages segment okay we are the sages sing it everybody So for this segment, we want to hear our guest's favorite Sage's moment. Oh, favorite Sage's moment. Um, I mean, I think it's got to be the show, right? Yes. Yes. And I don't know which one, but they're, they're so, I have no talent. So I've been so impressed by A, the talent that people have and, and B, their willingness to get up and, and, uh, and, um, and put on a show. But it's been a while since I've been to Sages because I'm often the person who will stay home and take call while my young oh, folks go to Sages. You're very yeah. kind. Yeah. You're kind yeah. To, to your faculty, to your junior faculty, give the, yeah. that experience to, to go to Sages and network. Yeah, so I'm sad because I'm not going to go to Montreal this year either. And, uh, oh, no. and I'd love to see Mellinger as president. I know, I know. It's too bad. But, uh, Kevin was planning on hosting everyone. A yeah, Michelin star I dinner. I had a dinner planned for all the Sages Stories guests. It was, uh, uh, yeah. So <laughs> you'll have to take a rain Man, check. I'll have to take a rain check next <laughs> we're gonna, year. We're, we're going to go to a hockey game. Yeah, we should go to yeah. a hockey game. Yeah. That would be fun. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. We're getting close to the end of the podcast. So perhaps you can share a message to medical students who may be considering surgery. Despite many efforts to change the reputation, there's still, I feel, a predominant theme that surgeons are tired, they're unhappy, they're intimidating personalities. And some of the students are still concerned that they're going to have a bad experience in surgical clerkships. I don't know how it's run at Stanford, but some programs are a little bit more malignant than others. Um, what are your kind of, what's your message to medical students? I mean, I think for medical students, surgery is a great field, right? We, um, now, I, mean, we I don't have to it. tell you this, right? You believe, you believe, but we get to, you know, take care of patients at, sometimes in their darkest moments and, you know, help get them through and their families through a tough time. Um, you know, we do things that, you know, can have measurable improvements in their quality of life and things like that. It's just a very different relationship. Uh, you know, that you can have great long-term relationships with patients in primary care and other specialties. So I don't want to discount that at all. But I think for those of us who are just more agentic, it just, it feels better to be moving and doing something um, more um, concrete. So I think the question I always get asked is, um, can you be a surgeon and be a mom? So that's a, the, I, a lot of the female medical students, right? They get told by somebody on medicine or radiology or some rotation, they're interested in surgery. And they're like, oh, you know, if you do that, you'll never get married, you'll never have a family or you'll never see your kids and things like that. So my, I tell people, my father-in-law is a pediatric cardiologist. 
mm. at Michigan. And so when I would be walking out of the hospital, like as a chief resident in surgery, like at eight o'clock at night, going to the parking garage, the light in his office was still on. He went into the office every Sunday to review uh, records of mm -hmm. his patients that he was going to see in clinic on Monday. So I think in any field of medicine, you can let medicine be your life. You can let your job be your life. Uh, you can control it. Like Diane Simeone was a great example. Diane and Ted, her husband's a transplant surgeon. Mm -hmm. You know, she coached her kids, you know, softball team, things mm -hmm. like that. So um, you know, again, a pancreas surgeon had a funded lab and still did that. So I think it's all about, you know, setting up what's important to you. And I always tell people it's, you know, cheaper than, than, you know, couples therapy to hire a really good <laughs> housekeeper. Um, <laughs> and, uh, it's definitely cheaper than divorce. That's um, for sure. Right. Yeah. You know, so just things that we don't want to do, we just pay for You're just, um, you know, yeah. so get good help. Yeah, I mean, along those lines, Stanford has been a huge leader in helping to define and educate those in surgical clerkships on the, you know, unfortunately, uh, persistently high rates of mistreatment and neglect, specifically on surgical rotations. Stanford curriculum has been a great resource uh, that I've used as clerkship director at Case Western Reserve and Neomed. Um what is your message to surgery faculty on how to improve this uh, unfortunate reality in our surgical, you know, clerkships at this point? Yeah, you know, and I think we still struggle with mistreatment. Our students are across multiple sites. We get these reports. We have no idea if it was in our department, urology, you know, whatever uh, at that yeah. Kaiser and stuff. But what we did, have you ever seen, there's an orthopedic joint society where, um, the women members of the society wrote down things that have been said to them, either by patients, oh, I've by seen this. Yeah. colleagues. Yeah. It's it's yeah. really wow. powerful. It was on and then oh, okay. the male members of their, the male leadership of their society, they made a video, read, you know, so they get this thing kind of flashed up and they had to read it. And they were like so disgusted. They, um, you know, sometimes they'd say like, I can't, I can't say that. I'm not going to say that and stuff because it was just so rude or inappropriate. So we did that as one of our, we have a monthly department m and and one of them is a cultural, one of the cases we do is a cultural quality improvement. Oh, that's a cool idea. So do you cut, so, out, you cut out time in the m and to do this? Is that how you? We do. So okay. we will have some type of cultural quality improvement. So one of the things we did is we just had different leaders read the mistreatment statements mm. that the medical students said. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like they didn't yeah. see it just flashed up and you had think? to read it. So we wow. kind of. Um, so I, to that's that idea, idea that was really powerful. And then, you know, when you hear those things kind of said out loud, we said, you know, that's not who we want to be. Right. Um, we all, we all are not always our best person every day, but, um, but that's not who we want to be. And so I think just hearing those things is, is helpful. That, that is such a great idea. I, I think as, as chair, obviously you, you set the tone there because yeah. I don't think that that would be something that uh, you could do without support of your chair yeah. uh, is to read some of the things that are written. Of course, you redact the names and and you just say this was written about one of our faculty. We don't exactly know who necessarily, but wow, that's really powerful. Is that a California thing? You think you can do that in Ohio? I think so. Random, I random think state? So. <laughs> yeah. yeah? I, think, okay. I think Ohio could do it. I think they could. Yeah. yeah. They probably don't have any mistreatment though. We do. No, we do. We, we do. We're, yeah. we're right there. We're right there with everybody else. We're trying to, trying to address it. It's just, uh, it's an ongoing battle. Yeah. So Sharon, are you coming to Pacific coast? Okay. Yes. Um, because are you Sharon dressing up our, as a sea Sh creature? Sherry Wren is our president. We have to be yes. there. Yeah. Are, are you dressing up as a sea creature? To be determined. Ooh, some, some, some dirt. Definitely here. not a mermaid. I'll tell you that. <laughs> well, maybe a seahorse. Yeah. 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 Pacific Coast is great. You're not part of it because yeah, you're not part of the Pacific Coast, but it's a great surgical association. And our very good friend, um, Sherry Wren, is president. And That's we all great. promised that we'd be there. She's great. So super excited to support her. We missed yeah. one question, which is we, we started to ask this before we close, which is if who, if you were to decide who our next guest should be on Sage's stories, who would you recommend? Mm. 
Can't say Kevin. Because <laughs> I'm already on. <laughs> you're already on. I think, um, and you're not doing your former leadership. Oh, no, you did Mellinger. We, we, we right. do. We, we kind of okay. go, we've, we're all over the place. I mean, we're, we're, uh, I, yeah. yeah, we've done um, old leaders. We've done up and coming leaders. We've definitely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so let's see. I would be. say, let's see. Uh, Jake Greenberg. I think has yeah, got right. some interesting yeah. things to talk about. Yeah. Um, Rory Pryor, I think, you know, really got her. passionate about vision. Chuck, okay. Done Jack's that one. done. Okay. Theodore Grand Sheriff, I think would be great. Okay. Um, okay. Talking about the black box and, yeah. um, you know, just how he views safety and technology yeah. that we okay. can use to enhance safety. Um, let's see. Those are, great. Those are great. Yeah. Well, Carla's on our list. Yeah. Carla, Carla, yeah. yeah. Carla Carla's great. Faculty. Yeah. yeah. Really looking yeah. forward to that. Yeah. Wow. Well, this has been really great. I really want to thank you on behalf of the entire Sages Story audience. I want to thank well, you for a... devoting your time and your precious time and sharing yeah. your story. And it's so inspiring and impactful. I love seeing you every time at, at our meetings, specific, specifically Pacific Coast. And I'm sure everyone who heard this story will be so grateful. So thank you for um, taking the time out of your very busy schedule and and sharing your story with us. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks so much for having me, both Sharon and, and Kevin. It's great to see you both. And I hope you have a safe flight back tonight. Are you operating tomorrow? No, I I, I was, and I cha I changed that as a wisely moved that to Friday. So yeah. yeah. So, yeah. but actually, I'm doing board uh, exam. You guys are talking about questions. I'm doing the board exam question reviews for the uh, Sir John uh, board. So so that they'll they'll get a lesser version of me on the review of the questions that I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> but that starts well, at noon. Well, try not to fail as many people as me. As you're into. <laughs> yeah, no, it's just no. reviewing the questions. You know, you, you write them and then you get together to review the questions and decide if they're, you know, appropriate or yeah. if they need to be yeah. altered. Yeah. So I'll do it some more. So that's, um, that's at noon tomorrow. So, uh, wow, so I, I'll right. have some time to rest. So my yes. trick for a red eye, which I hate doing, Mm. is oh, get yeah, a window seat true. get a window okay. seat yeah uh try if you could bring a real pillow mm. like for this quick trip i would just put a pillow in my suitcase i get yeah. on the plane and pull my pillow up because you you want to kind of have something to difference. lean against yeah. and then i don't know take some nyquil or something like when you call the uber yeah that's a good call i heard um tomato juice is good tomato juice. oh really oh, like juice, that one. yeah i heard tomato Tomatoes, juice. Though, so that might be hard <laughs> someone told me i don't know well, uh, so yeah. now you all know tips for taking a red eye as well so. tips for yes. taking a red eye yes so, somebody you know, who does not like a tip them, i'll give you my tip I do don't not like take them red eye. i know i don't I like know. them either the i don't tip. like that them either the i came yeah. in uh, to to help out and and I, I i had to get back so but next time i come i'm not i'm not doing a red eye got yeah. it well thank you mary yeah. i appreciate it dr han yeah. this Great ends another fantastic sages, sages stories, stories. Great. All right. And that wraps up today's episode of Sage's Stories. You can view the show notes for any links to sites we referenced today. Visit sages.org for membership information and for the most recent news from our society. Follow us on Twitter at sages underscore updates. Make sure you hit the like button and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. See you again next time. And remember, you can't spell minimally invasive surgery without sages.